Hi everyone, I've just been looking at last year's examiner's report on chemistry paper one. Now I'm not allowed to show you the full report, but what I can do is give you some tips so that you don't make the same mistakes as people last year. So I've compiled a top 10 list of places where people lost marks last year so that you don't do the same when it's time for your exam. So at number 10, we have know how to calculate the uncertainty in a set of results. So the uncertainty is the range divided by two. So if this was a set of results, then the range is the highest take away the lowest. In this case, it's 21 take away 15, which is six. And then for the uncertainty, we divide that by two. So we get three. And sometimes the examiner might want you to round up to the nearest whole number. So at number nine, many students from last year didn't recognize a neutralization reaction. These are the three main types you may come across. Acid and alkali mix a salt and water. Remember an alkali is a metal hydroxide like sodium hydroxide. Acid and an insoluble base makes a salt and water and an insoluble base is a metal oxide like copper oxide. And finally, Acid and carbonate is another example of a neutralization reaction. This time it makes a salt and water and carbon dioxide. In at number eight on this year's chart, many students didn't know the pH at the end of a neutralization reaction. So the pH of an acid would be somewhere between pH one and pH six at the start of your reaction. And like we've just seen, you can neutralize it with an alkali, a base, or a carbonate. When that acid is fully neutralized, the pH will then be seven at the end of the reaction. At number seven, we have explain the trend in melting points of the halogens. So the melting points and boiling points of halogens increase as you go down group seven. But can you explain why? If you need a reminder, I'll put a link up here now to one of my previous videos explaining this. So number six on my chart of common mistakes made in last year's exam paper is many students could not describe the properties of nanotubes. Nanotubes conduct electricity. They are made of carbon atoms and those carbon atoms are only bonding with three of their outer shell electrons. That means they have delocalized electrons that can carry the charge through the structure. So nanotubes conduct electricity. For the same reason, they also conduct heat energy or you could call that thermal energy. And because they are so very small, between one and 100 nanometers in size, they have a high surface area to volume ratio. Again, if you need a reminder about nanotubes, I'll put a link up now to a previous video. At number five in the chart, we have describe what you would see in a reaction by using the equation. So for example, the exam question might say, when magnesium is added to hydrochloric acid, what would you see? And they'll provide an equation to help you. So the first thing we look at is the state symbols. And on the right hand side where the products are made, we can see that a gas is made. So you'd actually see fizzing or bubbles. On the left hand side, we've got a solid and there's no solid on the right, we've only got a solution, a Q and a gas, which is shown by the G. So the magnesium or the solid disappears. If there is a color change involved, you'd have to say what color it starts off and what color it changes to. It's not enough just to say there would be some sort of color change. At number four, we have an old favorite. What is a strong acid? And you need to remember a strong acid is one that fully dissociates or ionizes to produce lots of hydrogen ions. And I'll put a link up now to a video explaining this in more detail. Number three, this is one just for the higher tier candidates, how to write a symbol equation from scratch. So that involves working out the formula of each reactant and product and then balancing the equation. So up here now is a link to a video where I explain how to do this in a few easy steps. At number two is a question which I've seen time and time again each year, and that is explain when an ionic compound such as sodium chloride or lithium bromide can conduct electricity. 
So you need to remember that as a solid, it cannot conduct electricity because the ions are fixed in place and cannot move around. However, when it's a liquid, either because it's molten, it's been melted, or it's been dissolved in water to make a solution, then those ions are free to move around, so it can conduct electricity. And at number one, the top of the chart is calculate the mass of a solute in a solution. So for example, if we dissolved 6.4 grams of sodium chloride, which is salt, in 50 centimeters cubed of water, how much sodium chloride would be dissolved in one dm cubed of water? Well, the first key piece of information we need to remember that many, many people forget is one dm cubed is 1000 cm cubed. So then it's just really a maths problem. If we've got 50 centimeters cubed of water containing 6.4 grams of sodium chloride, then to work it out for one centimeter cubed, one centimeter cubed of water contains 6.4 divided by 50, which is 0.128 grams of sodium chloride. Then to work it out for a thousand cm cubed, which is one dm cubed, 1000 cm cubed of water contains 0.128 times 1000 which is 128 grams of sodium chloride. If you found the video useful please remember to subscribe I will be bringing out a similar video for paper 2 to let you know the pitfalls so that you don't make the same mistakes this year in your exams. Thank you for watching.